so good morning and good evening also to Sydney. It's like the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, just to, to, today we'll start with a, a Skype intervention from Catherine Gibson from, from Sydney, and then we'll have about 20, 25 minutes for direct questions for, for, for her before uh, going into the panel. But this is part of the same discussion, obviously, about specific models of survival of recapturing the things we talked about yesterday, management, the economy, and so on, uh, in the light of what we call economic and ecological perspectives and disasters. So uh, I will leave uh, the stage to you, Catherine. Welcome. OK, well, thank you. And um, it's wonderful to be joining you uh, across the world. <laughs> and, uh, thank you for the invitation. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but um, I've been just over there not that many year, weeks ago, so I just thought it would be better to try and connect um, through this wonderful telecommunication system, so I hope it does work. Um, and I know that you've been discussing um, this, or this question of future vocabularies for, I guess, for the economy, for, world, for the world, for survival, and I, I guess that's a very, um, a, a topic that's very key to the work that Julie Graham and I have done as J.K. Gibson Graham um, in the various works and books that we've been involved in. So I thought I could try and um, interact with the questions of temporality and um, the logic of the postism that was mentioned as one of the themes you're discussing, um, the questions of commoning and commons, and then is how do we survive otherwise. And what I want to do is kind of relate a bit for a few minutes anyway to the different books that we've written, including the most recent one which, you know, touches on these kind of issues. So um, just to, um, I guess for those of you who may or may not have read The End of Capitalism as we knew it, A Feminist Critique of Political Economy, which was the book that Julian and I wrote in 1996, uh, I just put this cover up of the um, Turkish translation of the book um, uh, not that many years ago, but I love the image that they found to put on this that kind of encapsulates at least one aspect of the book. You know, there's capitalism portrayed as a kind of machine um, that's, that's got its own logics and dynamics, eating up the world, gobbling it up, throwing it out. And there's Julie and I as the kind of Davids throwing our stones, lobbing them over to this Goliath to try and um, bring it down. And um, I guess, you know, that's a kind of literal <laughs> sort of representation of what we were trying to do. But I think they did grasp the picture, the, the essence of um, what, we were what, the, what the objective of that book was, much more than the old um, version that Blackwell put out, which had Sisyphus rolling a stone up a hill, and a stone kept coming down to attack him. Um, but anyway, in that book, I guess we laid out a beginning of a, of a research project that really tried to um, move away from this vision of an economy as a machine and only one kind of machine. Um, and we use this idea of a diverse economy or a, a more inclusive vision or representation of the economy. And we were arguing that so many of the representations of economy are so narrow um, that they preclude any alternative politics, that you're locked into this system which provides the bottom line to life. Um, and we needed a way of reframing the economy in order to have an alternative politics to actually address this question of other survival, other forms of survival. And this image of a kind of an iceberg with these activities underneath the waterline that were not part of economic theory or economic discourse, but were, of course, very evident to feminists or to people working in the majority world. This was our, uh, an attempt to start to represent the economy. And just recently, um, an artist, another artist in the UK, redrew the, the iceberg for me um, as part of a reciprocity agreement. Uh, I was to write a small essay that went into the catalogue of um, an art exhibition on um, economic issues that um, Catherine Byrne um, has um, curated. And so she organised this kind of uh, reciprocal um, exchange between the artist and the exhibition, and they redrew the, the iceberg in this kind of nice way, I think. Just thought I'd put that there, given many of you are art workers. And I just thought I'd throw this other image in, which is also very colourful, but it's a, a vision of the iceberg 
are translated into a Pacific context to show a floating coconut, um, which was much more relevant to people in Melanesia, where I've worked in various action research projects trying to look at the gendered nature of the diverse economy, um, where in fact most people in the world are, and in, in places like the Solomon Islands are not working in the formal economy, but are surviving through a whole range of informal economic activities and non-cash economic activities. So I guess, um, you know, our strategy for taking back the economy or to rethink the economy was um, based on a number of different thinking practices. One was uh, developing a different language, uh, which would start to think, talk about and represent the diverse economy. Um, and this, this kind of three, three stage um, politics, I suppose, was represented in our book, A Post-Capitalist Politics. The second aspect was to create new subjects that could inhabit a different kind of economy and then um, collective action as uh, a form of, you know, rebuilding and building new kinds of economic um, entities and practices and, and making them more cohesive and, and stronger. In our more recent work, I think we have tried to um, uh, develop this, these three strategies of a language politics, a politics of the subject and a politics of collective action to kind of develop more f fully what do we mean by the kind of an, a, an economy that places ethical, ethical interdependence at the core, which is our vision of a kind of a language of a community economy. Um, when we come to thinking about subjects, we've also been challenged by all the work that's going on around ecological humanities and multi-species being to say, how do we think about more than human subjects um, of economy, not just the, the humanist human subject, but our relationship with other kinds of species and, and what does that mean for talking about subject subjectivity. Um, and we've also started to think about collective action as not something that is driven by, you know, human intervention, conscious, conscious human intervention, but more as, as how collective action takes place within assemblages of human and non-human um, in, in connect and connectivities and so on. And I hear we've been influenced a bit, uh, quite a bit by actor network theory. So um, in the most recent book that Julie and I started before she died in 2010, but we also started it with Jenny Cameron and Stephen Healy, and it's called Take Back the Economy. Um, we, we've continued on with this, this kind of um, reframing of an economy, taking back these kind of very uh, everyday uh, economic concepts of work, business, markets, property, and finance, and try to recenter what do we mean by what, do, what does mean what does work really mean if we take our ethical interdependence with each other and with our environment um, seriously, and what work is really for is for survival to some extent. So we try and reframe these kind of areas of the economy in terms of what we call community economy concerns. So in terms of work, we, we reframe it in terms of surviving well together and with the earth. When we think about business, we think about business as a site which generates surplus and is, is a mechanism by which surplus is distributed and how that takes place. Um, when we think about markets and in exchanges and, and transactions, we're thinking more about what are the ethical encounters with others that take place through those kinds of transactions. Uh, when we think about property, we're looking at the relationship we have to what we share um, and various forms of property, both material and immaterial. And so we're interested in this process of commoning. Um, and when we started to think about finance and what really finance was, we started to think more in terms of the way in which we use our savings to invest in futures and what kind of futures we are building. And the other, I guess the last concern that we're interested in is this question of um, consuming sustainably, which really comes into all those dynamics. And I need to, I guess, just restate the, the point that we make in a post-capitalist politics, that when we use the term community, we're really drawing on the work of Jean-Luc Nancy, who's, who's talking about that inherent being in common that we are born into when, we're, when we come into this world. And that the process of living together, the process of being together is a process of a becoming community, of learning to uh, work with each other and res in respect with respect to each other. And the other includes earth others, you know, other species, the, eco the ecologies in which we live in. So 
we're not using the sense of community in that kind of cloying sense of knowing who the other is and that notion of sameness, which I think is one way that community has been co-opted in many different political regimes. We're using community as a space of opening for um, negotiation and decision making. So when we talk about community economy concerns, all of those concerns are, are never sorted out. They're always under the process of negotiation. So I guess coming to the question of survival, um, our reframing of, of, of work um, is both in terms of the diversity of different kinds of work that people engage in, and this is our inventory of a diverse economy, just one dimension, um, you know, along with waged work, of course, we have all the other forms of alternative paid work and all the forms of unpaid work that really make up our, our society, including uh, things like slave labor and indentured labor. Not, I mean, not this, this reframing um, or this inventory of a diverse economy isn't trying to show all the good things. It's trying to show just what's out there in terms of the radical heterogeneity of ways that people labor and work. But the question is, how do we actually live together um, in this process? And many of us are you know, stuck at this top level working wage work or salaried work to live a certain lifestyle which is actually undermining our survival in so many ways. And the book in Take Back the Economy tried to kind of bring up different uh, metrics and ways of starting to interrogate our situation um, around survival. And, and this just shows um, two that we use at the top there for just starting to unpack what are the different kinds of work that we do in a 24 hour period and what are the different profiles, um, you know, you could, uh, you could be an Australian coal miner working a 12-hour shift of paid work, no time for unpaid work, very little time for recreation or rest. Or you could be an academic doing exactly the same thing. Um, or you could be a, a, rich, a downshifter, a person who has moved out of the wage labour force or been forced out as a precarious worker, perhaps as an artist. And, but there are many ways that um, the labour we do is fitting together and the diverse kind of inventory helps us to unpack those. But what we're interested in is saying, well, what sort of well-being is created by the different kinds of work we do? Uh, and here we're trying to drawing on a lot of the work that's going on now around um, happiness indicators and well-being indicators and we kind of drew on those to say, well, we could have a well-being scorecard that looks at all the different dimensions of well-being. But we need to add into this what is the planetary well-being that goes along with this kind of lifestyle or this kind of work profile. So here, our notion of surviving well isn't just, again, about a human-centered vision of survival, but um, trying to bring the planetary survival um, picture into, um, into the question. And I guess our, our argument in the book is that we don't know how to have other survivalisms yet, but, it's, it, but we need to do the work of interrogating what we're doing now and ways in which we, as collectives or as people living in communities, might start to share different kinds of work profiles that might have less impact ecologically um, on the world. And uh, in the book, we, we have a lot of different kind of tools and techniques. And one of the others that really comes up in the property chapter is this one called a commons yardstick, where we start to think about the way we're living in the world, um, not just for now, um, but in terms of generations hence. How do we start to think about the kind of survival we're involved in right now, and what does that mean for people in the future, our ecologies in the future, and drawing on the kind of vision that many indigenous communities have of saying, well, anything we do now, we need to be thinking through its impact seven generations hence. If we start to bring that, that kind of um, metric into our thinking, uh, we have a different kind of, um, I guess, a different whole picture of what we're doing and what we could be doing. Um, the other techniques are there of thinking about our transactions and so on, but I just wanted to move on because I don't want to talk for too long before questions start, about the ways in which we're talking about commoning and commons in the book. Um, and take back the economy. And here we're really unpacking property in terms of its diversity, again, in terms of alternative property forms, um, private property, of course, but alternative private property, and then the open access um, property or things that we share. And the question we're asking is how, um, how do we share what sustains us now and into the future? And here we're really interested in 
um, unpacking this kind of division that I think has dominated a lot of the commenting debate between public and private, between state and an individual and so on. And we use this device of a commons identity kit to say that the ownership of property is one thing, but it isn't what dominates whether think something is commoned or not. You could have private property, you could have state-owned property, you could have open access resources. They can all be commoned if there is a community that shares the, that resource or the access to that property widely, that negotiates its use, that distributes it to a community um, that performs care and takes responsibility for that property. Um, and a lot of the struggles, I guess, at the moment are around the ways in which enclosure is taking place and many of the, the interesting politics are around how do we start to re-common both enclosed property, um, unmanaged open access uh, resources like our atmosphere, and how do we also create new commons. Um, and interestingly, I think this little kind of um, um, inventory of a different kind has been used by people, a group of artists in New York City used this identity kit to try and identify the different spaces they were using to perform their artwork and do their practice. And they um, mapped out, you know, in New York, which privately owned spaces they had access to and was, were they able to common those, what publicly owned um, areas they were using, what, uh, what actually common property they had and so on. So it, this is something, these kind of tools we're hoping will be use, useful to people to, again, not necessarily um, produce solutions, but produce conversations that out of which new kinds of solutions might emerge. And I just lastly wanted to show you some examples, I guess. Um, this is the Rubin project in Paris, in Cologne, um, that's been initiated by the um, Atelier d'Architecture Autogere, AAA. It's a group that I've been working with where they've had access to unused land um, in a, this northeast, northwest part of Paris. They don't try and own the land, they just try and get access to it. And they know that probably this access will be transitory um, and everything they build um, has to be able to be taken down within about 48 hours. So this is a takeover of a street in the neighborhood where they've built a recycling um, and workshop laboratory, um, which is, is really thinking about the future. It's saying, you know, when we don't, are all, when we're not all driving cars in the future, all these roads will be space that we can start to re-inhabit. And this is an example of re-inhabitation of a road where you can still pass by, um, but um, the space is being used for um, local workshops. And again, it has to, be, it can be taken down in 24, in 48 hours, because that's the, the rule of use that they actually have. Um, in that spot. So I guess, um, yeah, I think that's probably all I need to say at the moment. I'm just trying to um, think into the problematics that you're worrying about and thinking about. Um, and I, I hope that's given you some kind of um, start for the way in which we've moved in our work. I guess I haven't talked about assemblages and so on, but we could talk about that in the discussion. And I might think about trying to close this thing down now, if I can. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, now I can see you more. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> now I'm on the screen, I don't know why. <laughs> Shouldn't it be our guest? <laughs> So, is that something I've done? No, Why I don't not? think so. It's the producer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's your screen, yeah. There are plenty of you, it's okay. Oh. <laughs> Feels very odd to me, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, one thing that, that of course, uh, that I've for a long time fascinated me with, with the, the work of J.K. Gibson Graham is the, the, the journey uh, that's been undertaken in, in the writing and in the three books. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could talk about that. It feels as if though clearly, I think you write about that in the introduction to your second book, that the first one was a, uh, a delirious critical use of theory, of theoretical language. <laughs> 
and the, mm -hmm. the latest book feels almost like a how to do like a like a manual mm -hmm. a user's manual uh, mm -hmm. so um, and in, and I was wondering how you how you think of that in terms of what you the phrase you've used of thinking practices of these kind of ideas yeah. of thinking practices yeah yeah well the first book was really clearing the space I think for uh, being able to do the kind of work that the Community Economies Collective, which is the group that Julie and I began, but it's become uh, quite a lot of people now. Um, so I think that the you know the first the end of capitalism was definitely us being theory sluts, as we called it. You know, thinking around <laughs> and using feminism, using anti-essentialist Marxism, using anything we could to try and destabilize this vision of a representation of the economy as only capitalist. So we only ended that book, I think, with scoping out this idea that we could start to talk about the radical heterogeneity of the economy outside of this sense of it having these dynamics and logics that were in inexorably unfolding. You know? So we just, we just kind of sketched that out. And um, I think the thinking practices and strategies we had, we had were much more uh, informed by anti-essentialist anti -essentialist thinking and feminist post-structuralism, really. Um, and in the post-capitalist politics, we kind of... Um, well, in the, by the time we wrote that book, we'd been involved in quite a lot of action research projects in communities uh, that we were involved in or living near and so on. So it had... Uh, we, we, you know, we'd gone out and started to talk to people about a different vision of economy, the iceberg idea. You know, what does that open up for people? Um, and we'd also tried to think about how do, how do we become different subjects? Well, how do we start to desire a different kind of economy when we're so locked into the subject position of being a waged worker or being unemployed or these kind of identities that are very tied into uh, a capitalist vision? And, you know, we, we found reluctant subjects wherever we, we went because it was very hard to, to start to desire something that you had no vision of. At the same time, we weren't attracted to the, the kind of um, blueprint vision of, of a future that a lot of people were trying to roll out, you know, these kind of 10-point plans of what we should... It just reminded us too much of a kind of, uh, you know, a, a state socialist vision or a, a particular kind of thing. So we were, we were kind of... I guess looking around for a different kind of language and um, you know we were developing the idea of diverse economies, we were developing the idea of, of subjectivities and how do you start to uh, hail people in different ways and, and what an enactment of a different kind of economy was and, and we really, I guess we realised that there was so much going on in the world already in terms of alternative experimentation but so much of it was locked within a discourse that saw it as not strong enough, too weak able to be co-opted, etc., etc. So I guess the, the next book is really trying to, um, to bring to the fore all the econ economic experimentation that's out there, but kind of organise it a bit. <laughs> you know, everything could be seen as commoning in our book, but we try to, we're trying to kind of give people a vocabulary that starts to say, you know, what are transactions really about? Let's think about them as encounters with others, distant, near and far. You know, uh, what what... How do we start to talk about surviving well? What is the language we can use? And how can we bring in well-being studies to help us do that? So it is very much a popular book. We've written it in that way. We've written it in a very easily accessible language because we wanted it to be used by people in groups, by students, by artists, by workers, just being able to pick it up and read it. I think it's actually quite theoretical, but it's not... Um, presenting itself in that way, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I guess that's, um, I think as we, as we wrote it, we thought at the beginning, when Julie, you know, before Julie died, we really thought it was just going to be a popular version of a post-capitalist politics. Mm. It was going to be like a manual that was just saying what was in the post-capitalist politics. But in the process of writing it, and in the years after she died, I mean, I think there's been so much happening in the world with Occupy movements and other things. We actually confronted lots of things we hadn't really thought about and started to develop a, a perspective on these. And I think the question of finance and commenting were probably the two chapters that we were least familiar with in terms of material, but we really pushed ourselves to say, well, what would a community economy approach to this be? And so I feel like there is, it's, even though its, it's format is very different, 
it's still very much part of an unfolding project. And I guess the other big thing we tried to do in that third book is really seriously take on the question of the environment and, and the more than human, but it, it's still very minor. Okay, so um, I think Dr. I'm sure there are questions from the room. Uh, I was told that you should, you have to quit your desktop. That would change the image that people see. So they would see you rather than me. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Stop sharing. Yeah, Is that better? Like, yes, that's ah, it. I thought it was something like that, yeah. Sorry. Okay, so uh, yesterday we talked about, and I think you mentioned this also, the, 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 uh, so I was wondering if you could maybe say a few words on the relationship between the idea of reluctant subjects and the notion of community, because yesterday we talked quite a bit on the dark side of community, namely the, that you also mentioned this idea of sameness that has been, of course, criticized by a certain feminist series theorist and then looking f instead to this notion of uh, being in common that you that you draw f where you, that you draw from Nancy and how that plays into community building how do you see that in terms of these community groups taking back the economy mm. well I, I guess the way we've seen it is um, the becoming community is the becoming out of the kind of negotiations that are happening around different kinds of economic practices um, and we could start to think of different becoming communities around each of those things. I mean, for instance, we could we could take the encountering other and look at the ways in which, um, you know, the whole ethical kind of shopping is is one sort of one one aspect of that. But people are starting to inhabit a community in which you know chickens who live well is a part of it, you know, or farmers who are making their coffee. In, in the Andes or wherever and the world are part of something that is becoming through the kind of transactions and different kinds of ethical transactions that are being performed. And of course we could critique, you know, the fair trade movement, we're not doing enough, etc., etc. But there is an attempt to develop a different kind of economic community through those transactions. Um, now, it, it's not the sort of community that is place-based necessarily, although I think you can also talk about place-based communities that are trying to become in different ways, like the transition movement is trying to do that. So uh, I guess we're trying to diversify the sense of what communities are as well and, um, and basically see them as, as something that are, is always going to be um, having to be, there's always going to be decisions around what's in and what's out. <laughs> We can't avoid that. Uh, and how do we do that in a, in a respectful way? I mean, one of the issues that always comes up when we use the example um, of the Mondragon co uh, cooperative movement um, or cooperative corporation in the Basque region of Spain, which, you know, as many people know, has been an interesting economic experiment since the 1950s. But one of the difficult issues that that community always has as a becoming community of worker cooperators is who's, who's, who's in it and who's out of it. And many of the criticisms of that uh, movement have come around those boundaries of the ways in which they've had to negotiate um, this idea of eventually joining but not joining now or using outsourced workers in order to maintain their economy and keep the commitment to regional employment, which is at the core of their work. So I think, yeah, every community has a dark side and a downside, but it doesn't have to be something we... We, we turn away from because any community is going to have to have these kind of boundaries and so on. Yeah. So, Ruben, you have a... Yes. Uh, hello, I can, I can see you. Uh, I don't know if you can... Maybe you can see me. So, uh, it, was, it, was great, it was great to hear hi. Also some, hi, some uh, uh, reflection on um, the more ecological aspects of uh, uh, survivalism. But uh, a question that came to mind when you were talking is how... How uh, much of a challenge do you think it is to, uh, uh, to to bring in this kind of new radical ecological understanding of the world associated with a shift to a more uh, post-anthropocentric position? And, uh, for example, you mentioned, you know, you know th thinking not just in terms of the well-being of humans, but also the well-being of uh, other species or the planet. How much of a challenge is is, to, is it to bring those ideas into existing? Uh, anti-capitalist theories that uh, you know when when they were when they were formed originally didn't really have such such a clear uh, 
idea of, the, of this uh, uh, e ecological dimension. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, Nancy as well. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you know his, his idea of, of, of the commons and the common well-being. I, I don't know how much that also had a, uh, originally had a, an environmental uh, dimension. And the way you're, you're mm -hmm. it seems like you're, mm -hmm. you're offering to, to expand that to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to include uh, an understanding mm -hmm. also of the, of the, uh, of the, of the planetary. Uh, dimension as well. I'm just wondering whether, whether there is a there there is a tension or whether, how far you can actually uh, go with that. Whether there are any kind of internal contradictions between a, uh, a a form of theory which was very much focused on on the social uh, and, and and human preoccupations to to widening that to to include uh, uh, mm. non-human animals and and the planet in general. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that's a really a big challenge for us at the moment. And some of my students are trying to do that, you know, um, because I, when you're coming particularly out of a Marxist background where human labor is kind of at the center of the politics and, and the center of what is seen as value and, uh, and what, where the surplus comes from, where, of course, you know, if we were to include the gifts of nature, which also are, are treated as a surplus to some extent, you know, that's been always excluded to some extent from that economic vision. So one of the, one, uh, an ecological humanities theorist, Deborah Bird Rose read Take Back the Economy and said, so you're just trying to put in all these externalities back into the economy in a sense, or into our vision. And that, that's probably one way of looking at it, you know. Um, but for instance, I have a student or, who was working on the notion of community uh, where microbes and soil organisms are seen as part of community as well. And there's a whole movement in Australia now of farmers realizing that they've not, they've just assumed soil was this substructure that kept plants up, you know. But there was a whole living community here that they could be interrelating with in a very different way and producing a very different kind of agriculture. And there's a whole a kind of politics around seeing the farmer as part of a living community with the microbes, you know, the organisms in the soil or in the animal's stomachs and the animals as well. And so there's a sense in which our, the, sen the ecology um, and the economic ecology is broadening. And of course, that has a lot of challenges for economic thinking. Um, I don't, I think, but I, I, I feel like looking at these things as ecological services, <laughs> which is the way most of the ecological kind of more mainstream economists do it, they, you know, the earth is just giving us these services and we have to pay for them, etc. Isn't kind of where I'd like to go with it and not and it's not really where some of my students are going. They, they're really trying to produce a, a sense of livelihood in a different way, um, including the livelihoods of, of other beings. And, and I think there is a whole new economics of practice that might emerge when we start to see ourselves um, in that kind of, in that relationality. Uh, but you know, it, it needs a different kind of economics, I think, or an extension and a, and a, re a, a kind of really rethinking of the way human subjects have been so much at the at the centre of the way in which we've we've conceptualised economies. But it seems to be a very exciting and productive area to be thinking in. Um, and you know, I think there are we could again look at real live existing experiments of communities who are establishing different relationships with with non-human others. And um, I mean, in, in, in another technical sense, you know, the whole relationship people are having now with renewable energy, um, especially in, say, in, in this country with the move towards generating your own power on your own uh, rooftop and so on, there's a whole new movement called solar citizens here, where people are engaging in this technology in a very different way. And they're seeing themselves as being part of some kind of a new relationship with the planet, you know. So I think, I think there's some very interesting assemblages that are emerging that um, are a different kind of subjectivity and politics, you know. So we're going to try and squeeze in two more questions. I think you had, Andrea, had one. I think this was first. And... Okay, no, somewhere, sorry. <laughs> but three questions, four. Okay. We'll try, four questions. <laughs> four questions. Five questions. Okay, I, I just have one. Um, hi. I, hi. I was just um, wondering, since uh, you join us from the other side of, of the world and, and uh, that we can do this through digital technologies, um, if, if you think there, or if you have any knowledge or experience with 
these <coughs> sort of becoming communities or, or commoning that are not um, determined by shared local geographical space. I mean, I'm thinking also in terms of, of uh, alternative currency or alternative um, online economy mm -hmm. uh, projects that are green and that are sort of purely online. Um, <laughs> so I just, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess my questions mm -hmm. are if you have any experience with, with online communities that or <laughs> commoning that could be successful. Mm. Well, I mean, I guess I am part of an online community in the sense that our community economies collective is uh, about 40 people in different parts of the world and we interact around this kind of thinking. Um, but that's, and I guess a lot of academic communities could be seen in that kind of sense. Um, and I know there's sort of, you know, there's a lot of you know, a lot of hype around the internet and open access software and so on as a form of commoning, which I think it is in some ways, in many ways. And it's also a, a, a place of contestation around, um, you know, privatising or, or controlling. Um, and I guess some people would argue that, you know, it's all very dependent on a particular kind of... Uh, you know, access to copper fibres and optical fibres and various um, minerals and so on. And if we were to take our ethical other relationships seriously, we need to be thinking about all those kind of issues that are underpinning this incredible technology we do have. So again, I don't want to see these things as just um, the solution, <laughs> but there's, it seems to me there's a kind of, uh, there's an incredible opportunity there is through this very kind of interaction we can have to develop different relations with, you know, people in other countries, other nations, that are, is very hopeful. And there's also access to open access software that allows us to do it. Um, I haven't got any, I guess I haven't been directly involved in any other kind of um, community economy that's using that, um, you know, obviously we're trying to develop a website, but that's a kind of a one-way kind of relationship. Um, and I'd be interested to see, you know, the experiments. I mean, obviously things like peer-to-peer -peer finance are, 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 and using the internet to do this is another form of economic experimentation that's having a lot of impact for people. Um, yeah, but I just read a critique that Maria Mize made of... Uh, commoning through the internet and you know she ends up arguing that people are always still grounded in place and need to to think to, and that these technologies are also can be traced back to places um in terms of their own inputs and so on so you know i think we, in each of these communities we need to be considering all the um the things that it allows us to do and also the things that we perhaps might be ignoring that are the other side of it and uh yeah, that's a kind of incoherent answer to your <laughs> wonderful question. <laughs> it's getting to be dinner time. <laughs> uh, hi, Catherine. Sorry to delay you from your dinner no, that's a okay. bit more. Um, yesterday we talked a lot um, about uh, artistic institutional relations. So I wondered if, um, and, and their often highly problematized relationship to forms of patronage, forms of um, direct and indirect e economic relations that were not graspable or, or knowable. So I wondered yeah. if you could tell us any more about the experiment you, you touched on in your discussion um, of artists trying to map the relations they had in New York using your toolkit, or I think you called it an identikit, I can't remember, but, but yeah. Using, yeah. using your protocols. I wondered if, if you have any more information about that experiment. Um, I, I don't have much more, really. I mean, they they were kind of... Um, I guess they were doing it as an inventory just to see, you know, where... what they were using and where they could start to push at things to kind of maybe make more claims or do things differently as a group, too, because they, they were trying to work against that kind of very individualistic kind of practice of many artists, rather that, that you know, that weren't, they weren't thinking about their economics... Um, livelihoods, I guess, um, that um, effectively. But just that brings to mind the conversation I had with Kate Rich, who's a, an artist some of you might know of, who in Bristol, who actually is Australian, but she was saying how she feels like within the artist community that this, this whole, the economics of livelihood is something that's very rarely interrogated, although that's obviously what you're doing. Um, 
and she she works well she volunteers in in the cube theater i now remembered the name of this uh, cinema in bristol which is totally run on volunteer labor which is a very interesting kind of experiment but the other thing that comes to mind is this term patronage you know um i have a student who's been who's working in cambodia on social enterprise and of course um in Southeast Asia, this question of patronage and patron-client relationship is always brought up as an aspect of the, the pre-capitalist vision or, you know, aspect of these communities and something that's not modern and therefore should be squashed, etc. And it's always seen in a very negative way. Um, and Isaac's been trying to really interrogate that to say, well, what are the kind of ways in which patron-client relationships actually can underpin forms of community economy? and why do we necessarily put it in the, the bad box and start to interrogate those things in, in a new way, not to see them as sort of always futile and therefore bad or something. So it just, you know, it's kind of interesting, I think, to, um, you know, if we really are taking on board a diverse economy, <laughs> then different kinds of relationships, including patron-client relationships, might be a possibility, might be something that can be used to um, kind of continue to have a more heterogeneous economy. Um, yeah, so I just, I just wonder whether, you know, with the identity kit we try to unpack that one-to-one -one relationship that people have had with, you know, public, commons, private, non-common. And I think, I think we need to think about the re social relationships we have around property and, and the social relationships we might have around patron-client relationships and then interrogate them in more detail as to what, can, what is possible, what kind of interdependence ethical independence could be negotiated within those parameters of different property relations and so on. Otherwise, I think we just get, we kind of get block, blocked all the time, you know? um, But I guess, you know, I haven't got another concrete example to, to bring to bear here. Yeah. Okay, question down here. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, Catherine. Uh, thank you so much for uh, Hearing you talk about your uh, new book, it's, it's really interesting and very, um, for me, very recognizable. I'm uh, Ine Gevers, I'm a Dutch curator, and we recently had a large uh, show in the Netherlands uh, at the Gemeente Museum called Yes Naturally, which was actually a show on how to become ecologically intelligent. And it had, you know, it had an actor network uh, theory approach, new materialist approach, very much. Uh, we had um, Vandana Shiva, uh, Donna Haraway, of course, Timothy Morton, uh, but also Luciana Parisi. So many uh, authors and, and, of course, I mean, 70 artists with also some artists uh, coming from New York, um, but also two Greenford I mentioned, uh, uh, Natalie Giermenko, you might know her. Um, my, the, the, our, yeah, my question, actually, because we have been... Um, trying to make this exhibition and also draw in people very much in experiencing, uh, 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 trying to draw them in, in um, <laughs> experiencing uh, to make a strong relativization of the human center, central position. So even being re reluctant to use the word Anthropocene actually, because we, you know, because um, it is a term that is uh, coming up constantly, but that also reproduces the notion of us being in control, us human being in control, although, of course, this is the situation. <laughs> now, there are at the Netherlands at the moment, uh, um, uh, but also not only in the Netherlands, also some artists in uh, the United States, no, in England, uh, Jordan and uh, Fremo, I remember, who also use uh, different methods of permaculture as ways of for for commoning as ways of trying to uh, find different relations uh, and uh, interdependencies and i wonder if that is something that also didn't read your book yet i will of course <laughs> that's fine yes i think you know i think um, many people have said to me who know more about permaculture than i do that there are very many principles in the book that are so alike permaculture you know um, I guess in the end we do take inspiration from ecological thinking to some extent and here we're doing that through the work of Jane Jacobs, you know, who wrote about the economy of, or the, the nature of economies and also who wrote about cities but, you know, she, she always argued just as ecologists do that diversity is important in any kind of system and 
So, and of course that's very central to permaculture as well. And that's very much central to our vision of, of, a, of a human, of a healthy and community economy, that there's, a very, there's going to be diversity of enterprise forms, diversity of transactional forms, diversity of forms of work, and that working with that diversity um, and putting things together in new ways is really one of the kind of edges, the cutting edges, I think, of experimentation for how we can live differently. You know? um, obviously, diversity of forms of financing and so on. So, so I think there's, um, there's, and then there's, I guess there's lots of other principles in ecological thinking that um, we've tried to operationalize, but I can't remember them right now. <laughs> But I think the, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, oh, I think another one in um, the permaculture thing is the idea of redundancy, that you have lots of different ways of doing the same thing. And that's, again, when you look at, um, you know, projects like a, we've got a friend who's working in Detroit on all the different forms of urban gardening that are going on there. And they're actually creating a diverse system that's quite resilient in lots of ways. And they're all doing the same thing, you know, which isn't efficient in some ways. And yet it's from an ecological point of view is actually much more able to withstand all sorts of pressures. So, you know, we can be playing with those kind of interactions, I think, between natural systems and so-called human systems. But, you know, that break, that's where the thing's being broken down anyway now. Um, and, you know, I take the point around the Anthropocene and the way in which it still puts the human at the centre. Um, but I think it is also, an, you know, this awakening to a different temporality, the fact that we are now agents in geological change is making us stop still and think about temporality in a very different way. And um, I, mean, I just recently was reading Bill Connolly, William Connolly's latest, or one of his latest books, The World of Becoming, where he really plays with this idea of different temporalities of you know, weather systems, um, you know, geological systems, um, our economic systems and so on. And we have an opportunity, I think, to, with this idea of an Anthropocene, <laughs> to step into both, as Dipesh Chakrabarti would say, a different way of seeing ourselves as part of a species, a human species, and in relation to other species, but, but seeing ourselves in a very different kind of time frame. And it... Um, you know, it's kind of, it's scary, but it also opens up. I mean, one of the things it does is make me feel like we can slow down a little bit too, you know, that we don't have to have all the answers. Um, we, you know, there's a sense of urgency that people, that I think every, every last, next climate scientist sort of prognostications and next, the next person tells us about how many species are being lost in Australia and so on. It, there's this whole urgency thing going on. And at the political side, we've got this stalemate and then as theorists, I think we've got this incredible pressure to be coming up with something. And, and, and mainly, it, I feel like not knowing, I don't know what to think, you know. <laughs> and so getting, you know, trying to play with these different temporalities and these different challenges uh, and seeing what creatively comes out of them is important at the moment, I think. Um, someone just wrote, uh, Scott Sharp wrote in a, a recent Rethinking Marxism, it was a kind of a a bit of an homage to Julie's work and, and my work too, but it was talking about impotentiality as very important to thinking about the relation to potentiality. That notion of not having anything to say um, is very important at a time when we need something to say, you know, like getting into that moment so that there's, a, so something new can emerge and uh, it's, a, it's challenging, you know, but it sounds like this exhibition was an interesting place for that kind of thinking too. Okay, we have two more questions and then we'll let you go. So, TJ. <laughs> uh, hi, Catherine. Uh, my name is TJ Dimas, and um, I'd like to add to the thanks uh, for your presentation uh, and, and the significance of giving attention to, to the flourishing of all these diverse experimental practices around commoning and post-capitalism and uh, uh, ecological sustainability. Um, and I'm wondering if you could situate that discussion um, within the context of uh, the wider sphere of um, what some would see as the, as the continuing hegemony of neoliberal capitalism. 
Um, and particularly the, the ongoing, uh, at least according to someone like David Harvey, the ongoing turn toward, toward a, a right-wing revolution, basically. And I'm thinking particu particularly of the, the return to order in the, in the post-Occupy moment. And I'm also thinking of the, the, the embraced uh, neoliberal developmentalism that you see in countries, especially in the BRIC part of the world. Um, uh, for example, India's recent election of uh, Narendra Modi um, and his commitment to, you know, uh, encouraging and, and intensifying even the, the kind of de developmentalist capitalism uh, that is, for, men, for many others, uh, part of the, the kind of necropolitical world that we live in right now. Yeah, that's a hard one. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm in a country that um, didn't have much trouble through the GFC and you know we've been basically digging up our resources and selling them at you know making making major private wealth out of the resources of Australia but because of that we didn't really suffer in the GFC and now we've got a, a government in power one of these neoconservative ones that's constructing austerity constructing the need to pay back our debt which is like the lowest of any country in the world as proportion of GDP so you can really see this neocon kind of ideology of austerity and neoliberalism uh, gaining ground all over the place. Um, having said that, I've always worked against the grand narrative that David Harvey has been so for. <laughs> um, and, you know, I just had to recently comment on the Kilburn Manifesto, which is, again, a, a, a manifesto that Doreen Massey and Stuart Hall before he died and Mike Rustin put out, and it's on the web. And again, it, it's, it's again like a 95% discussion of neoliberal policies and practices and a 5% discussion of, well, but there's always going to be cracks in this and there'll always be ways in which there's an outside and an excess and perhaps we've got to work with that. But... So I guess my, my strategy has always been to work at that 5% and expand it to 100% and say it's everywhere. And that's a kind of a, a, strategic, um, a, strate a strategic decision on my part. And it's probably a blindness and some many people see it as very, uh, you know, pig-headed to ignore these, these practices. And, you know, having just come through the Australian budget, I can see why they're saying that, because now I'm really emboldened to want to just be saying, let's look at how this neoliberal ideology is spreading everywhere and is, is being enacted everywhere. But, you know, that to me, if I do that, then it, it sort of undermines the whole project of trying to do the other, trying to have another possible world. So I, I think I'm in a quandary at the moment, and oh, I'd like some help because, um, I mean, I know I want to write a blog about the Australian budget from a community economy point of view. Like, if we to put the returns on investment to well-being, to distributive surplus, to, you know, all the things that I see as part of the community economy concern, we could do an accounting of what's just happened in the budget and show how it's not building a future for anybody, you know. So I guess, you know, that would suggests to me that the, the language we have to fight back with is still very um, undeveloped and underdeveloped. Um, the fact that, you know, we're still getting a, a country like our, my country, 51% of people voted this particular government in, means that there's a lot of talking that needs to happen in our society in order for the kind of community economy concerns that I have um, to be more, to have more kind of validity. And um, yeah, I feel like Formal parliamentary politics at the moment is is a disaster in almost every country, <laughs> um, and there's a lot of I guess there's a lot of um, apprehension that those systems are actually ever going to be able to work again to meet the challenges that we have as a, as a globe. And but on the other hand, what we what is coming up as a, as an alternative kind of democratic form. Um, it's a big question mark in my mind. But I do feel that unless we have a more robust other economic language with which to start to make the kind of claims we want to make, um, we're, still, we're still stuck in these kind of old debates of public-private privatisation and so on. And when I, when I use the, 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 you know, the identity kit to think about the things that have been privatised, say, in Australia, many of the things are... are uh, things like hospitals that no one had a relationship with, in a sense. There was no sense of a community that cared for or took responsibility for many of these public assets. So it was very easy to privatise them and see that efficiency was going to come by privatising because there wasn't a set of sense of relationship 
Whereas I can see, for instance, in my society, primary schools are a public asset that people have a relationship with, that they take responsibility for, that they that is a kind of common practice. And it's like I feel like we need to be finding those things where there is a sense of commoning, even by middle class people who aren't interested in, in a kind of alternative politics at all, and showing them how important it is to life, you know. So how do we step outside of these ideological frames and actually relate to each other with a language that people can start to use to to do this kind of work of building different futures, you know, is, is still my challenge. Um, but I totally agree with you that it's a scary proposition and one could very much go with the David Harvey way, which is to continue to dot the I's and cross the T's of the neoliberal project, because it's, it's obviously there. Uh, hi, Catherine. Um, Laura McLean here. I'm responding to this panel later and also from Sydney. Um, the ah! budget, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, yeah, the budget this week has been devastating. Um, and there is a sense that this country that is prosperous and in a resilient position economically really has had this forced upon it and that there is now, I mean, Australia likes to think of it as itself as being separate from the world in some sense, or islands itself <laughs> a lot. Um, and now that's kind of been, um, mm. it's, Abbott's really tried to globalise in every mm. sense he can. Um, and I've seen this perhaps as an opportunity for Australian society to talk, like learn tools of resistance. I think Australia can be quite apathetic. Um, mm. But mm. I, there's been a lot of protests lately and there are more planned um, of people mm. actually really resisting. I was wondering if you saw, mm. how you saw this moment as an opportunity for this society that is not, I mean, I've been in the UK for two years and I've seen the effects of the mm. conservative government there. And now I'm, it's terrifying to see it happening in Australia. Mm. Um, mm. I'm wondering if you see this as an opportunity for artists and academics and society to learn to resist in a way that maybe they are in a position of strength in that they haven't been um, subjected to this kind of policy so much in the past and are in a stronger position economically perhaps and socially? Mm. Well, I'd like it, I think I'd, I'd like it to be an opportunity. Um, and I think, I don't think we're getting any real leadership from an opposition, for instance, the, you know, the formal opposition as to how to, how to react. I guess I'm, um, I'm interested in the kinds of forms of politics that people who aren't, haven't, necessarily been political can react can relate to you know and I, I think that this is perhaps where artists and others who can be quite creative about political kind of uh, uh, formats might be useful you know or, you know <laughs> useful is a horrible way to, to put it but you know we really need to be creative about the diff the kinds of ways we can enroll people into these discussions about our future I mean there was just recent uh, two years ago there's been this kind of study of measures of Australian progress and people mention like this is a survey that's gone across the country they mention wanting to have a world that their children and their grandchildren can live in they want to have different relations with the environment they want these kinds of um, social justice issues this comes out of that kind of social research it doesn't come out of the polls to polling kind of focus groups that they have before before um, elections so it, it seems to me there is there's much more we can draw on that's out there in terms of sentiment of sentiments of care for each other and for environments. But the way in which the, polit the political terrain is so ideologically kind of cut up now, those expressions aren't being able to be heard. And so that's, I think that's where there's a, a real need for a different space. Um, and I don't know that marching on the streets is going to pull that thing out of people. Uh, there has to be new ways of doing that. And I do see, you know, there is a lot of outrage at the moment. Um, how that's going to be mobilised um, effectively uh, is a big question in my mind. And it does make me feel like I'd like to be more outspoken about what I do because I feel like a lot of the work I do is not very well known in Australia. <laughs> it's actually more known outside than it is here. So uh, I do feel like it is an opportunity to start to, you know, bring these kind of metrics and techniques that we have to bear on a real situation. So, yeah, and thanks for the encouragement to do it. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you with us this morning, and uh, I hope you will have a wonderful evening over there on the <laughs> other side of the world. Um, I suggest that we simply just go on with the panel now and bring you to the stage so we can continue the, 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 the topical discussion. We need some time to, uh, okay. Catherine, thank you so yes. very much. Maria here. I just want to thank oh. you. Please join me in thanking Catherine. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> I'll be in touch very soon and I look forward to that. Thank you. Ciao. Okay, well, thank, thank you, you very much. It's been wonderful to be part of the conversation and uh, I look forward to seeing what comes out of it. So Thanks again. I'll, Bye. I'll, I'll cut out now. Bye-bye. Okay, good night. Bye.